morning. Good morning, everyone. And uh, let me begin by placing on record my thanks to the International Association of Tamil Journalists for inviting me to come and share my thoughts with you on this occasion. The first thing that I want to say is, is that I think the title that you have given the uh, deliberations today is particularly appropriate in the current context of Sri Lanka because we are still five years after the end of the war, or going over five years, we're still very much in a post-war context as opposed to a post-conflict one. And I am very keen and repeatedly give my definition of what I mean by post-war and post-conflict because I think it goes to the heart of the matter in this respect, in that post-war is very simply the guns having fallen silent. Whereas post-conflict, I think, is what we are all striving to achieve, and that is one in which sources of conflict are not sustained or reproduced, and certainly new sources of conflict are not put onto the public agenda. And sadly, in the Sri Lankan context, I think what we see is a sustenance of the sources of conflict and the introduction of new forms of conflict onto the agenda, new in that they have existed perhaps in forms before, but they're now a lot more manifest and enlarged in terms of the public debate. So I think it's very important to maintain that distinction and to look indeed at the role of the media in facilitating, nurturing that transition from what would constitute post-war to what constitutes post-conflict. At the heart of the matter, therefore, is that huge deficit in terms of democracy. And as we all know, the liberal democratic principles of democracy in particular place a particular responsibility on the media to facilitate the transition to democracy and to sustain <coughs> democratic institutions and processes thereafter. <coughs> now, all of this, of course, is happening in a global context which is particularly inhospitable to the advocacy and enjoyment of fundamental rights and freedoms as we have understood them. And I say that because it is certainly the case in the Global South, and in Sri Lanka in particular, but by no means exclusively so. We all know the challenges, we all know what's happened in terms of WikiLeaks, Assange, Philip Stone, the growth of the national security state, even in the so-called developed world or global north. We also know of the way in which the good old-fashioned, crusaders of democracy and media freedom have been treated by the national security state in this part of the world, as indeed in the part of the world that I have come from. So in that sense, it is a global context initiated in this particular phase, of course, by the George Bush war on terror post 9-11, which created a permissive environment for the cumulative and successive whittling down of democratic rights and freedoms as one has understood them in the past. And in that sense, in that permissive environment, not unlike in the Cold War, labeling someone communist, for example, meant that one could do anything to them. In that particular environment, governments that declared groups terrorists were almost given carte blanche to go ahead and destroy them. And in the process of doing so, there was insufficient attention paid to what the consequences of that permissive environment and license would be <coughs> to the post-war situation and the movement towards post-conflict. The other point, therefore, that I want to make to you is, is that in the beginning of this period, what one sees is a situation in which the media, and here I'm talking very much in terms of the mainstream media, the print and electronic media of Europe, are targeted, as indeed has been the case in Sri Lanka 
I don't need to go into all the details with regard to it. But what I want to reinforce and emphasize is that the first line of attack, as it were, was very much in terms of the media. And if you remember, in 2009, the argument was that the end of the war would be a war without witnesses, that only those journalists who were ideologically sympathetic, or quite frankly, apparatchiks, would be allowed to be stationed with the army and report on the last days of the conflict. But what is most interesting in this period that we're talking about, and indeed in the contemporary world today, is that even though the mainstream media challenged, victimized, targeted, may have cowed down in certain important respects, this is not a world in which victims do not have a loss. Because there is a new technology. There is the whole social media and civic media which provides the means of a reply. Most importantly, provides the space and platform for the counter-narrative to the official propaganda that has been put out by governments. Now, at the same time, of course, it's double-edged because from Putin to Rajapaksa, autocrats, are very adept at using social media too. And it is arguable as to whether the presidential media unit in Colombo is a lot more savvy with regard to the use of social media than a lot of civil society organizations within Sri Lanka. Yeah. So whilst there is the, the instrument, whilst there is the technology available to be able to challenge the prevailing orthodoxy, one has also to be very much aware that the orthodoxy itself has available to it this very media and these instruments and is not averse to using them as well. So most things that happen in Sri Lanka get out, but they get out on social media. If one wants to see oppositional views, if one wants to see dissent, <clears throat> one has to go on the web, by and large. But what is now also happening, though, is that the manifestations of the democratic deficit that are not explicitly and directly connected to the ethnic conflict that we have in our country, that those dimensions are now being reported more frequently in the mainstream media too. They are reported in terms of not simple questions of rights, be it of political rights, of self-determination, autonomy, or whatever, or indeed in terms of accountability and an attack on impunity, but rather in terms of the gross mismanagement of policy. And here in particular, I'm thinking about the reportage that we've had in Sri Lanka, in the local media, the, what I call the mainstream media, as opposed to the web, on, say, for example, the resolutions in Geneva. <clears throat> the criticism of what has been happening in Geneva has been largely in terms not of the need for a fight against impunity, a need for accountability. Rather, it has been you have mismanaged our foreign policy to such an extent that this was entirely avoidable, and you are therefore responsible for a foreign policy disaster, seems to be the argument. The whole question of rights, etc., is not brought into it at all. But there is another, under, under, another <coughs> dimension, another undercurrent, which is very, very strong, and that is that the mainstream media, even in the criticism of the democratic deficit in terms of basic governance is very scared still of being shut down, of being imprisoned, detained, killed, destroyed. You know, there hasn't ever been a cartoon depicting the defense sector. 
in Sri Lanka. And I think therein lies a particular story in terms of the fear, I don't know whether there's loathing too, but certainly fear that the individual and the position carries with it. Cartoons depict the president of Sri Lanka, Mahindra Rajapaksa, but never the defense secretary. So that fear is still very much there underpinning what is happening. No one dare take on that national security state in the form of the defense secretary in particular. I've had personal experiences myself where I'm <coughs> writing critical of that particular individual or his establishment or decisions taken by him are edited out and basically mangled and distorted in the mainstream media. So you have to have an outlet in terms of civic media or social media to get that point across. And then comes the question, apart from as to whether the government, the presidential media unit has great access and expertise in terms of fighting back, as it were, uh, with regard to social media, of how widespread it is throughout the country. How many Sri Lankans within Sri Lanka actually access social media, engage with social media, with regard to political questions? And I think the jury, the verdict is out on this. We certainly do know that there has been an absolute explosion of mobile telephony in Sri Lanka. Absolute explosion. The penetration in terms of rural Sri Lanka may not be so great. But there is particularly a youth sector that has mobile phones, can access the net, is aware of the need to access through proxy sites because certain sites have been blocked, etc. To what extent, to what extent that that really constitute a kind of critical mass, I think is probably going to be seen to a certain extent in terms of an impending presidential election and quite possibly an impending general election as well within the next four to six months in the country. But in all of this, there is another point that has to be made. And I think one sees this on the web. One sees this distinction being demonstrated on the web as well. There is the danger of ethnic enclaves, of the division in terms of the media of reportage of news, whether it be in the mainstream media or whether it be on the web, in terms of what is happening to the Tamil people or Tamil speaking people in the Tamil media what is happening to the singular people in the singular media and the English media, of course, being disproportionately influential at one level, trying to strike a sort of balance between the two, not out of imperatives and fairness, but out of simple survival, quite frankly. And this is the great tragedy in the country, insofar as if one sees it in terms of supporting democratization, then the ethnic division is a major impediment because we all know about the horrendous land grabs that are happening in the north and east of the country. We all know about it because it has come on the web and as a consequence of it coming on the web, as a consequence of various actions taken in respect of it, the mainstream media has also had to cover it. But the same thing is happening in the rest of the country, too. There are land grabs in the rest of the country as well. There are evictions of people in the city of Colombo in defiance, flagrant violation of court orders. If that continues, it is entirely conceivable <coughs> that the numbers involved may be as great or even more than those who were incarcerated in Manic Farm at the end of the war in 2009. At the same time, <clears throat> if I took something like the LLRC, for example, that it was barely given the coverage that it ought to have been given, unless, of course, it was a Gotabe Rajapaksa or a Douglas Devananda going and giving testimony before it, 
the possibility of the linkage between the citizens of the country placed in not dissimilar <coughs> circumstances, uniting in their sorrow and in their pain, was lost. Lost completely. Yeah. So that is a major impediment in terms of the democratization of bringing all the peoples of the island together in terms of democratization. That is a major impediment. The second one, I mean, I, well, not the second one, but the overarching one, of course, is the whole question of fear, of the past, the experience, the record of the media in the past, the fear of what may well happen in the future if one dared to go out. However, I think there have been some spaces for resistance. We ourselves, through the website Ground Views, have pioneered a certain amount of archiving, digital archiving in terms of what happened on the ground in 2009, which was commended by Google itself, by using the Google Maps to show what happened on the ground. We've done stuff which has come under criticism, but nevertheless we managed to do it as far as hate speech in the context of Alut Gamal was concerned. Documenting and archiving, and this is largely with regard to the documentation and archiving of hate speech with regard to Alut Gamal on the web uh, rather than in the mainstream media. And there again, it's also interesting. One of the biggest arguments made by the mainstream media in terms of the what I would call inadequate coverage with regard to Alut Gamal was the argument that we have to be responsible. We have to be responsible. And of course, this argument of having to be responsible means that you don't report. And you allow a huge space for rumor, for speculation, where the things could just get worse as opposed to getting better. Because remember, for example, in Alut Gamal, as some of us do know, telephone lines were cut. Electricity was cut. It was pre-planned, it was premeditated, it was deliberate, and it was a targeting which had, without any question of doubt in my mind, the support and sponsorship of the regime. It could not have happened otherwise. So media in Sri Lanka, in this context, does face some very, very strong challenges. Yeah. And I think one aspect of it that we don't talk about <coughs> is what happens internally within media. I find it hard pressed to cite, quite frankly, and with all due respect to my media friends in Sri Lanka, a media organ in Sri Lanka which has consistently held for principle in the face of, a, of adversity <coughs> Arguably, except for them. And there are, there are legitimate observations and criticisms to be made of that media organ, too. I have not seen this in terms of the mainstream English language newspapers or singular language newspapers. And this is also partly because they are seen simply also as business enterprises. A culture of media supporting democratization as being an agent of change is not there in Sri Lanka anymore. It is very much profit orientation. There is no investment by media houses in the training of their journalists with regard to any number of new ideas and indeed new technologies that are there on the market. The government steps in and provides laptops and loans, interest-free and whatever, but we all know what the origins, what the intention, what the objective of doing that is. So as a consequence, you do get a situation in which people almost become journalists by default. I have I say this to you, and sometimes it's especially irritating, but it's also quite hilarious sometimes. I have had so many inquiries from what would pass, I suppose, mostly from sort of rookie journalists in mainstream newspapers, 
but not only just rookie ones, some much more senior, asking me to comment on some particular issue, be it the Sixth Amendment, Thirteenth Amendment, Eighteenth Amendment, Seventeenth Amendment, or Olive Garden, or whatever. So I say, yes, what would you, you know, what do you want me to say? What, what do you want me to comment on in particular? No, Dr. Saranmurthy, you say what you like. So then I say what I like if I'm in a good mood. And then they say, they say I ask them, do you have anything to ask me now? No, Dr. Sam, have you finished? Is there more you want to say? But that is sadly tragic. The level of journalism at one, one level. There is no investment in it. There is no pride in the profession. Is it a profession? is a question that needs to be asked as well. Is it really a profession or is it something that is just providing rupees and cents for businessmen who at the end of the day probably do have political agendas and <coughs> believe that they are like the old Lord Northcliffs and Rodemirs, etc. of you in this country that they can make and break governments, that they are the press barons who make and break governments and determine, and determine what is happening, how people think in the country. <clears throat> so there is a major problem that we have in terms of the question of the media in the country supporting democratization as to what can be done within media institutions Two, enhance the level of professionalism and expertise that is there to do the simple job of reporting. Yeah. So a number of challenges then. That's one, the climate of fear, of intimidation, impersonation. The issue of ethnic bias, which I think is a problem, most definitely. A third one, the fourth one, that civic media which is an explosion of opportunities, is an explosion of opportunities, not just to those of us who are fighting for greater democracy and human rights and all of that, but it's also an explosion of opportunities for those very people in terms of regimes who want to suppress fundamental rights and freedoms. They're very savvy <coughs> in terms of using social media themselves. Yeah. But I want to end on a more optimistic note. There was a time in Sri Lanka when it was so bad, and this is a, a favorite quote, um, a story that I like to tell. The time in Sri Lanka that was so bad that you would have newspapers reporting like this. There once was a candy parahan in which an elephant went berserk and killed someone. A well-known Sri Lankan English language newspaper reported the incident with the headline, Elephant Kills Tamil. I like to think that that is in the past. They won't report it in that way now, that they recognize what is so fundamentally flawed with regard to it. Uh, that, that kind of thing won't happen. And so, whilst I hope that there are certain unfortunate excesses from the past that will not be repeated, let me say we really need to focus <coughs> at the whole question of civic and social media in terms of the topic that you have identified and ask ourselves how well we can organize to be able to get the maximum benefit out of that. I have friends of mine who are on Facebook and Twitter, and we'll say, look, we don't want to come and waste our time outside Fort Railway Station or around Lipton Circus, because we have a much wider audience that we can reach out to and say what we have to say. And indeed, and some of them with relative anonymity, because they don't have to reveal themselves. Yeah. Is that the way of the future? Is that how democracy is going to be enhanced? And let's not forget 
how the Arab Spring panned out and is panning out. That's right. Yeah. So, at the end of the day, we have to be aware of the opportunities provided by the technology, but we can't forget the first principles. That is absolutely crucial and absolutely important. So thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to questions and to comments. Thank you.